Hello, my friends. Today is May 13th. My name is Joseph, and this is Markets Weekly. This week, we're going to talk about three things. The first thing we'll talk about is the most recent senior loan officer survey. Many market participants have been focusing on this because it gives us insight as to how badly, if any, the panic in March impacted the banking sector's willingness to make loans. Secondly, we'll talk about the Fed's most recent financial stability report. In it, there's an interesting tidbit that suggests that the impact from commercial real estate to the banking sector may not be what we expected it to be. And lastly, we'll talk about the Fed's fight in, in, against inflation. The Fed is slowly getting inflation under control, but maybe too slowly, and that might impact how it behaves in the coming months. Now, let's start first with the Senior Loan Officer Survey. So for those of you who don't know, the Fed surveys about 60 commercial banks periodically to try to figure out whether or not they're tightening their lending standards. Now, this indicator has been pretty useful over the past few decades in determining whether or not the economy will fall into a recession. Now, this chart here, I show the uh, lending standards to commercial and industrial middle market and large firms and commercial and industrial small firms. You'll notice that there are two lines, but they basically go the same way. Um, over the past few decades, you can see that this line goes up and down. It oscillates like a sine wave. It usually goes up, that is to say, banks are tightening their lending standards, heading into a recession, and as the economy comes out of a recession, this indicator shows that banks tend to loosen lending standards. Now, there's a couple ways to think about this. One is that banks have a pretty good uh, grasp as to what's happening in the economy. They have lending relationships to a vast amounts of businesses. They also see the checking accounts of a lot of people so they can get a sense whether or not the economy is doing well or doing poorly. And perhaps when they sense that the economy is slowing down, they become more conservative in who they make loans to. After all, they don't want to make loans to someone who is unable to repay them. So you can think of it as perhaps a banks were willing to make a loan to someone with a 650 credit score. Now, as they tighten conditions, maybe they're only willing to lend to someone with a 770 credit score. Um, another way to think about this is that um, as banks reduce their lending, borrowers have less money to spend. So there's less money to buy stuff, miss money to make investments, and that naturally slows the economy down. So there could also be a causal relationship where less bank loans means that uh, economic growth slows down. So I'm sure there's true, some truth to both these uh, angles. Um, many people were particularly interested in the most recent uh, loan officer survey because it's the one that was conducted after the regional bank panic in March. Now, just for some context, as you can see in the chart here, uh, the banks have been tightening their lending conditions uh, for almost a year. So for the past several months, they've already been steadily tightening. Now, the question was whether or not what happened in March significantly impacted their lending standards. Did they significantly retrench because they're afraid of further bank runs and so forth? And the survey w was actually pretty clear that it didn't that they, they they did not significantly retrench. Now here is the um, lending standards for to large and middle market firms, and you can we can look at the middle the lending standards for small firms later as well, and it's about the same. And in this survey, it showed that overall, 54% of banks reported that their lending standards were um, unchanged, and. 43% uh, they had tightened, quote unquote, somewhat. So banks continue to tighten their lending standards, but it doesn't seem like they reacted very strongly to what happened in March. Uh, what was particularly interesting to me, though, is when, when they break the survey down between large banks, which include some large regional banks, and other banks, which are the thousands of small banks most of us have never heard of, and many were most concerned of, that they would face deposit runs. Now, the large banks... 52% of them reported that their lending standards to large and middle market firms were unchanged. 
Um, for the small banks, 57% reported that their lending standards were unchanged. So it was actually the larger banks that uh, tightened their lending standards slightly more than the smaller banks, which is which is pretty interesting. Um, so this measure seems to me to suggest that banks continue to tighten their lending standards, but it, it doesn't seem like the panic with Silicon Valley Bank had a big impact on on their on, the, on them tightening. They were already doing so and continue to steadily do so. Um, now, the next thing we want to talk about is the Financial Stability Report, which is the Fed's uh, report that it releases twice a year that goes over what the Fed thinks of as potential vulnerabilities in the economy. This report is really interesting because the Fed has access to a lot of confidential data, so they're able to see things that most market participants are not able to see. As I went over the report, it struck me as pretty mild. There wasn't anything that really stood out except this box here on commercial real estate. Now, many of us have read in the press that commercial real estate is a source of major concern. Uh, but before we become too alarmed, though, I think it's important to note that commercial real estate is a really, really broad segment. Commercial real estate includes things like hospitals, so medical stuff. It includes warehouses. It includes multifamily. Uh, and it also, of course, includes office space and retail and things like that. Now, obviously, the fundamentals that drive, say, industrial space are going to be very different from the fundamentals that drive office space in downtown San Francisco. So if one segment of commercial real estate is doing poorly, that necess doesn't necessarily mean that everything else is doing very poorly as well. Now, we've all heard that uh, commercial uh, office space in downtown areas of big cities have been doing very poorly. Many companies want to work from home and they're not fully back yet. That means lots of vacant office space that potentially, you know, might always be vacant because perhaps some people are moving to permanent work from home. And in connection to that, retail space that was dependent upon all these downtown workers is also suffering. So if you don't have workers going down to uh, work in downtown offices, that means a restaurant in downtown is not getting as many customers as it used to. So those segments of commercial real estate are, are, are segments that are doing very poorly and have, are, people are rightly concerned about it. So the Fed took a look at that segment of commercial real estate and wanted to figure out just the potential of contagion from that segment of sensitive commercial real estate to the broader banking sector. Uh, many media reports report that uh, commercial banks, particularly smaller banks, are big lenders to uh, commercial real estate investors. And so that would suggest that if the commercial real estate segment is not doing well, then maybe these uh, banks will not do well as well. Again, as we've noted, commercial real estate is broad. So let's just focus on the sensitive aspects of commercial real estate, that of holdings of office in downtown retail commercial real estate. Now, according to this Fed study, it comes with a very surprising result. Now, the, the report breaks down exposures of commercial banks to the sensitive segment by the size of the commercial bank. So uh, they said that the Category 1 banks, so the biggest, biggest banks, the JPMs, the cities, the US uh, GSIBs, had pretty small exposure to this segment, um, only collectively 100 billion which sounds like a big number, but is actually a pretty small part of these uh, the assets of these banks. Next, the Fed broke it down to exposure by category two to four banks. Now, these banks are the large regionals. So you can think Huntington or M&T Bank, banks like that. And another pretty surprising result, um, these regional banks only have about 110 billion in exposure to um, office in downtown retail commercial real estate. So that's also a pretty, pretty small exposure. However, when you go beyond the regional banks to the legitimate, legitimately small banks, remember in the US, we have over 4,000 banks and most of them are very small and you've never heard of. Those really small banks, like community banks, have collectively 510 billion in exposure to this sensitive sector of commercial real estate. Now, I think that was pretty surprising to me because reading from the news, you'd expect the regional banks to be 
uh, big investors in the space, but it turns out they aren't. It's really just these small banks. And you know, that, that, um, that's pretty concerning to me because small banks collectively are not that big and $500 billion would be a meaningful part of their total assets. Um, but before we panic though, we have to of course keep in mind that we don't really know how well underwritten they are. Perhaps the commercial, perhaps the small commercial banks were very conservative and they were lending to very low loan to value. Um, we, we don't know. Um, but the good news is of course, small banks by definition are not systemically important. So um, it, it's probably going to, not going to have a big impact on, on the financial system as a whole. Again, we, this study was not very, very granular. They don't have a lot of detailed data, but it's something to keep in mind whenever you read about um, panic in the commercial real estate sector impacting the banking sector. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the most recent CPI print, which was actually pretty promising. So as we know, inflation has been very high for the past couple years, and the Fed has been trying hard to get it under control. Um, CPI this month is showing uh, some moderation in some pretty important segments, specifically shelter. So shelter, so let's say rentals and housing, stuff like that, that is about 30% of CPI. And over the past few months, it's been steadily decelerating. So a few months ago, it was at 0 0.7 and then 0 0.6 and then 0 0.8. And now most recently, it's at 0.4% month over month. So there's a very clear deceleration in shelter. Now, we always knew that this would happen, though. Uh, one way to think about this is that um, when rents go up, it doesn't impact everyone at the same time. If rents went up today, then the people who had to renew their lease today would report higher rental expenses. But the other people, though, they would continue to pay their current rent until their lease was up for renewal, let's say next month or a few months later. So in a sense, this shelter inflation was something that was slowly feeding in to CPI. And um, we always knew that over time, it would gradually slow down uh, because the most leading indicators of rent, so rent being rent increases right now, uh, have been decelerating for some time. And it seems that that deceleration is finally here. So that's good news. But the bad news, though, is that, you know, when you think about the Fed's fight against inflation, it's not just eventually getting inflation down to 2%. There's also a time component to this, which is a framework that I learned from Bob Elliott, which is a really smart guy on Twitter, um, in the sense that if you take a long time to get inflation under control, you potentially could lose control of inflation expectations. Now, the Fed, being uh, largely run by economists, like to think about inflation through the lens of inflation expectations. The theory is that a big driver of actual inflation is the expectations of future inflation. So from a consumer standpoint, if consumers expect prices to be 10% higher next year, then obviously they're going to go out and buy stuff today. And if they all go out and buy stuff today, that pushes up inflation because everyone's going to, to buy stuff. Another way you can think about this is that if you're a big business and you expect prices to go up 10% uh, next year, well, then obviously you have to raise your prices 10% too. So that's why the Fed pays close attention to inflation expectations. Now, this is a graph of the University of Michigan's five-year, it's a survey of consumers, five-year inflation expectations. And you can see that it's spiking higher. Uh, it looks like it's reaching highs not seen for, for quite a few years. Now, we have had high inflation for a couple years. The Fed is getting it under control, but very slowly. And it might be so slow that inflation expectations are steadily rising. And that's going to scare the Fed a lot. Because from their framework, if you lose control of inflation expectations, um, you could lose control of actual inflation. And... This week, though, we also had some interesting uh, Fed speak from Governor Bowman, who is a voting member. Now, the market has largely expected that the last rate hike to be the last, and it was looking forward to future rate cuts. Now, Governor Bowman came out with this speech and actually suggested that she might want to hike rates again in June. Um, 
Here, I'll read a couple lines from the speech to give you a sense of how, how she's thinking about this. She says, should inflation remain high and the labor market remain tight, additional monetary policy tightening will, will likely be appropriate to attain a sufficiently restrictive stance on monetary policy. So again, she's saying that if things continue as they were, have been, I want to hike again. And later on in the speech, she says in the same paragraph, in my view, the most recent CPI and employment reports have not provided consistent evidence that inflation is on a downward path. So here's a voting member of the FOMC telling everyone that she wants to hike rates again in June. So again, when I think about the markets, as I've been telling you for some time, is that so far it's like this, it's been this one big bet that the Fed is going to cut rates later, so the dollar weakens and you got to buy uh, tech stocks. Now, I don't think that's actually going to happen. And the Fed is again pushing back against that narrative. When the market finally realizes that maybe the Fed is actually serious, that they may, might actually hold rates higher for longer throughout the year, um, that, that's when you can get some volatility and probably a bit of a correction in, in the equity markets. Okay, and my best guess is we're close to that part. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Thanks so much for um, tuning in, and I'll talk to you all next week.